Good morning. If you are watching live and uh, if possibly you are watching this as a recording, well, I'm not too sure what time of day it will be, so I can't give you a specific greeting. But hello. This is the first in a series of broadcasts aimed at the grade 10 and 11 English first additional language candidates. And as you can probably see by what's written on the screen, we are tackling here cartoons and comic strips. In actual fact, we are more or less tackling comic strips only because I haven't for a very long time seen an actual cartoon <laughs> present in any exam. But in this, our first uh, part of the series, which is a very short mini-series, we are looking at some notes and some definitions and, you know, the general background knowledge that you have to have in order to be able to study these things, after which in the second and third parts I hope to be looking at some real genuine questions from real genuine exams. But let's get going on our notes. Now, what is visual literacy? Now, with visual literacy, automatically we, the teachers, think of comic strips and adverts because that's what we have to teach in a classroom. So, this is, however, the actual definition. It's recognizing or understanding ideas, which da 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 da, but it's visible. Images, pictures, or maybe you're watching a movie. Okay? Visual literacy. The whole thing is it involves your eyes. Okay? Understanding what you see. There we have it there. Um, you know, in, a, in my previous series, is. <laughs> I'm mangling English on purpose, by the way. The plural of series is also series. It doesn't change at all. But um, in a previous series, uh, we've looked at comprehension tests. And the whole thing about comprehension is it means understanding. And to a certain extent, visual literacy in an exam is a comprehension test based on things that you see but only to a certain extent. Don't ever confuse it with a real comprehension test. Um, the, there are many different aspects to it. Now, let's look at some definitions here. A cartoon. That is what a cartoon is. Okay, I won't read it to you off the board. I mean, I'm sure you've got perfectly good eyes and you can read it for yourself. But cartoons have a specific function. But the whole thing about a, a cartoon is it's normally only one picture, whereas a comic strip, and there you have the definition, it's a group of cartoons. So they all, and then it says they're in a narrative sequence. In other words, they form a story. Okay, satire. And you must know uh, the meaning of satire. Okay, it's using humor to expose weaknesses. And, you know, here it's got human, social, etc. Um, but remember that it's ripping somebody or a, a um, specific group of people. It's ripping them off, making fun of them. And there is your caricature. Um, it's normally an exaggeration, which is like very obviously an exaggeration. The cartoonist will give, for example, if he wants to make the guy look much more evil, then he'll give him big bushy eyebrows. Or if he wants to make him um, look very old, he'll give him a long gray beard. Or uh, <coughs> what are the other ones? Oh, big noses. Also, um, they fit in very well. I know certain of our leading politicians, every time I see cartoons of them, They've got these most enormous noses. I can't remember who it was, but I do remember having seen it recently. Okay, next, body language. And this one is critical. This is also why punctuation is so important, but I'll go into that another time. Um, it's the nonverbal communication. When I am speaking to you, you are not only listening to the words coming out of my mouth, you're also listening to their tone, the inflection, when, I, when the um, 
The sound rises or falls. Does it get louder? Does it become softer? Okay, you watch my hands, gestures. Look, there my hands moving. You'll watch my face to see, am I smiling, which is happy? Or is it down like that to show that I'm sulky about something? Um, all these things, eyes as well. Hold on. You can't see my eyes. Look, that's what my eyes look like. Okay, and uh, when I'm doing that, you see the eyes are going wide. And it really matters because all these things give you so many clues as to what's really going on. It's not just the talky talky. Okay. Um, then, um, I've put a note there. You interpret these signals automatically, you don't think about it. You know what body language means. But here, in an exam, you have to actually do it consciously and think about what you're writing. Now, here, take a look at this. Um, it's a brilliant picture. I'm sure you can understand exactly what is going on there. But how? You automatically say, okay, boyfriend, girlfriend, he's persuading her, da 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 da, -da. Yes, yes, that, all that is correct. But now remember, if you're answering this as a question in the exam, how do you know that? And then you've got to look at the, the eyes and the eyebrows and the shape of the mouth and exact, the position of the hands and everything like that. It's a lot more complex once you actually start going into the details in the reasoning behind your answer. Okay, if you want to take up that challenge and try to answer this one, you may do so. If you're watching the recording, therefore, you may now pause, but I must move on. We're on limited time. Now, here is the body language of romance, and I'm very grateful to the person who gave me this one because it's really described in detail. Take a look at that. You've got the uh, eyebrows, you know, the sly smile, not a normal big grin, but just a hmm. A happy, contented sort of smile and chest out, <laughs> the hand in the pocket to show no, I'm casual and all these things and romantic language. Okay, this is the positive side of romance and um, I love the way that this was included. This, the, this, as I say, is not part of my presentation. It's one of the things that was given to me and which I've blended in. Now, let's go here. <laughs> now, immediately you can see, uh-oh, there's something wrong. How do you know that? How can you say what's happening there? All right? Now, I'm not going to tell you. I want you to work it out for yourself. I mean, you can see that that is conflict in process. But now you have to look at all the stuff that we've mentioned just a second or two ago. You must look at the, well, positions of the hands, facial expression, mouth, eyes, um, position of the bodies, etc., etc., etc. And again, I'm not going to tell you too much more. Work it out for yourself. I'm moving on. If you want to um, take a look at this and you're watching a recording, just pause it for yourself. Okay, now, it doesn't take a genius to know that that's a very happy soccer team up there. <laughs> How do you know that? All right. Once again, I'm not going to tell you. The mood. What visual clues can be used to determine the mood? Well, I'll tell you now, the mood is one of celebration and um, ecstasy, happiness. You know, smiles all around. Hey, we the, the, the champions. And uh, this is, obviously, this is just after the final, the, the final of 2015, it says. But how do you know that those people are celebrating and happy and shouting and all that sort of thing? I'll leave it to you to work it out. Okay. Now, this, as opposed to a, um, a picture, we now have a cartoon Right? Now, you can see what's going on.
But describe to me how you know what's going on. Okay? Um, you've got to say how, for example, what clues are there that the lady standing in the doorway is either a nurse or a doctor? <laughs> what clues are there to show that the, uh, the little boy running away is absolutely terrified? We can see it, but you must explain to me, how can we see that? Okay, think about it. I'm not going to give you any answers. All right. Now, here we come to our facial expressions. And once again, I might have to take off my hat and my glasses. First, we have happiness. Now, at this point, off come hat and glasses so that I can dramatize this. It says here, smile, eyebrows up, eyes open. Ready? Okay, smile, eh? eyebrows up, eh? eyes open. How does that look? Is that a happy face? This is the sort of face that you find on me exactly 15 seconds before I tuck into that sizzling steak on the plate in front of me. Does life get better than this? I don't know. Let's take a look. The next one is sadness. Okay, crying. Hmm. I can't do crying uh, just like that, so I'm just going to go boo hoo hoo. Okay. Eyes closed, right? Eh, corner of the mouth down. <laughs> right. That's sadness. Fear. You've just come around a corner, and what do you see in front of you? A great big crocodile. And it's a hungry crocodile. And it's looking at you as if you are good food. So what are you going to do? Eyes wide open. Mouth open. Ah! Eyebrows up in the center. So you got, ah! Okay. I'm not a fan of crocodiles. I try to avoid them under ideal circumstances. <laughs> right. Then disgust. You've just taken a lovely bite of a big pie. And what happens as you take the stuff away from your mouth, you see it's gone green and moldy in the middle, and you go, Bleh! okay, so what have we got? Eyes narrowed or closed, right? Mouth pursed, in other words, uh, down at the corners, tongue sticking out, right? Let's try that. Ugh! Did I get it right? <laughs> yes, and you must remember how to describe it. Okay. Surprise. Hey, gee, wow, I never knew that. Okay, eyes wide open, eyebrows up in the center, mouth neutral. All right? Huh. Interesting. Hmm. I've just found out that uh, Donald Trump is president of the USA. I never knew that. <laughs> Don't believe everything I say. I write too much fiction. Okay, anger. Okay, now you are cross. Somebody has just done something awful to you, all right? Eyes narrowed, okay? Eyebrows down in the center, nostrils flared. That's, eh? See that? Opening up the nose, and jaw clamped tight. <coughs> Anger. There we are. Pain. Okay. Um, let's say I've just made myself this lovely, lovely um, dish of food. And I reach out and I've forgotten to use a dishcloth or a heat pad or something. And I'm just grabbed hold of a dish which is at 175 degrees Celsius. What am I going to do? Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to have, what have we got? Eyes clamped shut. Yes, that's a normal one. Crying, possibly. Okay, mouth open with corners down. Ah, corners down. Ah. Right, not too bad. Okay, but the whole thing is here. You must be able to describe how you know it's pain or how you know it's surprise. These are details which come up in exams. Now, here we have an example of a cartoon. This is the Grammar Nazis cartoon, and I love to use this one because this is so much like me. My uh, 
youngest son loaded up a collection of movies on my computer for me. And in the, um, the folder in which he put them, the title of the folder was spelt without capital letters. I would not permit that. He had to come back and put capital letters there. It matters to me. <laughs> you know, title must contain capital letters. And of course, there you've got the example of what is very obviously a fanatical English teacher. <laughs> but the whole thing there, one single picture. Now, here is a comic strip. And of course, this is Too Much Coffee Man, one of my favorites. Got this from my brother. And uh, it's two or more frames, basically. This is an unusual one. Um, they don't use these in the exams. The examiners never use something like this. They'll use uh, the more famous ones like Hager the Horrible and Dennis the Menace and that sort of thing. All right. It could be because you've got certain things like frame three. And uh, well, anyway, let's not go into that. Now, the features of comic strips, you must know this. You have characters, obviously. You have body language. You have facial expression. We've done that already. A setting can often matter. Speech or thought bubbles, punctuation, movement. And we'll look at the technical details of that as we go through the, the exam questions. The font matters a lot. Um, the frames, obviously, they must be numbered. Stereotypes or symbols. I love stereotyping. It makes the best jokes. <laughs> and here we have um, a variety of speech bubbles and a thought bubble. Um, you can see one such as this jagged one down here is obviously expressing anger or something like that, whereas the normal speech bubbles like that, um, that's just you know, normal statements being made. Okay, the thought bubble, it's got the dot, 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 as opposed to a, a pointy stem or like that or like that, whatever. Okay. Finally, <laughs> this is just for fun. You do not have to know these terms. But I tell you something, if you are capable of using these terms, uh, it may just convince the marker that you are an expert concerning visual literacy, and in particular cartoons and uh, comic strips. Take a look at this. The first one is the Grawlix, okay? You can read, so I'm not going to read what it is, but here is an example of a Grawlix. Right. <laughs> in other words, it's a swear word, and it's made up of um, inoffensive symbols. We all know what that means, even though it's not printed out as is. Then you've got your agitron, that wiggly line. You've got a brifet. Oh, I used to love when I was younger. I used to love what... No, not when I was younger. I still love watching the uh, um, Roadrunner and the Wily e. Coyote. It's a glorious cartoon. It's funny. It it's always gets a laugh. And um, there, of course, as the Roadrunner takes off, you'll get this sort of like sound. And you'll find this cloud of dust left behind and the character gone. Right, emanata, there you've got your definition. It's to indicate surprise. The plude, <laughs> drop of sweat. Okay, and uh, if the character is very stressed indeed, then the drops of sweat are showering off him. And then you've got squeens. <laughs> I don't know who thought of these things, but man, I love these things. Okay, drunkenness or dizziness. You know, just after the cartoon character has been hit on the head with a mallet and uh, they're all wobbly and drunk or wobbly. And then finally, your wafterom, where you've got something, some smell or something, which is yuck, right? And there we have it. Um, this is about as far as we are going to go with our notes. I think we've thoroughly covered that. We're going to take a break. When we come back, um, we'll be looking at some examples of exam questions. And just by the way, a reminder, um, this is looking at cartoons and comic strips. And this is for the English 
first additional candidates in grades 10 and 11, although I suspect it's going to benefit a lot of other people. Goodbye for now. See you soon. Welcome back. Here we have the second part in our series today on cartoons and comic strips um, as visual literacy questions in exams. And of course, this is aimed at our English first additional language candidates of grades 10 and 11. Now, in our first um, episode, let us call it, we looked at the notes and the background information and the definitions and stuff. Now we are going to go straight to our exam papers and take real examples from real exams. And the first one is Dennis the Menace. And welcome <laughs> to possibly the noisiest Dennis the Menace cartoon that I have ever seen. Um, I must apologize, by the way, um, in the actual original exam, of course, all of these uh, um, frames were numbered, like one, two, three, etc. But uh, for some reason, I didn't remember to renumber them. Please bear with me. Right, let's take a look at this cartoon in a bit of detail. The first frame is, in fact, the title of the cartoon, and its title is uh, Munchin Machine. Okay? And our very second, uh, as the scene opens, we've got Dennis going crunch through a cookie or biscuit, as we call them. Okay, and some more munch crunch. And here, slurp. We used to always, when somebody used to suck up the last of their Coke through a straw. When I was younger, we would always make cynical comments such as, you know, that's the nicest Coke I've ever heard. Ha, ha, ha. But in this case, it seems so appropriate. Okay, then you've got Dennis um, thanking Mrs. Wilson. These are the only two characters in this cartoon today. It's the little boy, Dennis the Menace, and of course, Mrs. Wilson, the wife of George Wilson. Um, and you've got Dennis also here. I uh, don't know what could be better than your warm cookies and a cold glass of milk. And of course, she's grateful. She says, thank you, dear. Please note the word dear. That is uh, pleasant. And here we've got Dennis. So, you notice the little hick over there. And the punchline. What's for dessert? <laughs> and you notice how the lady's head is swiveling. Mrs. Wilson's head swiveling around there. You could see the lines showing that. Okay. Other details that we have here. What is the setting in this particular case? Think about it. Your clue is in this frame over here. We've got a pretty good idea what the setting is because it seems as if uh, Mrs. Wilson is working on a stove. All right? So, I don't remember if that uh, question was asked, but I would say that if they do ask what is the setting, I would say they're inside Mrs. Wilson's kitchen. Okay. And anything else? No, but you can notice the various sound effects and uh, very onomatopoeic munch crunch. Slurp. Right. So, good. Let's take a look at some questions, shall we? Okay, refer to frame one, and we shall do that. There we are. We've got Munchin Machine. Now, who is the Munchin Machine referred to in the subtitle? Well, I'll give you a clue. It's one of the two characters in the cartoon. <laughs> and who do you think is doing all the Munchin? Here is your answer. It is, of course, Dennis the Menace. And... Really, if you get a question like that wrong, I despair for you, because that is really Mark's Mahala. Okay, now this one is not so uh, easy. And just a reminder in this context, remember that the visual literacy is found 
in the language component of the exam. Therefore, language questions are to be anticipated in among the cartoon and, uh, sorry, the comic strip and the advertising questions. You're going to get language, direct language questions, and this one is a, a punctuation question. Okay, what is indicated by the apostrophe? Now, you have to know what the meaning is of the word apostrophe. Those of you who have been correctly educated will know that that little thing there is an apostrophe. Normally, an apostrophe will indicate either possession or omission. In other words, it can form um, possessive adjectives or it can form contractions. And the apostrophe um, is always in the place where the second vowel, or the third, for the fourth vowel, the final vowel has been omitted. Okay, so it's been used apparently here, because there's no S involved, um, I am going to say it's omission. Let us see what our memo answer says. You've all got it right? Okay, a letter has been omitted. In this case, instead of saying munching, they've used the Americanized form munchen. All right. Oh, as usual, when you find English, we've got a lot of words used which are confusing because either it's two words used for the same thing or it's a single word used for multiple things. Now, apostrophe is problematic because it is either this little punctuation mark or it is a figure of speech. Apostrophe is when you address a dead person or a non-living thing as if they were alive and as if they were living people. So unfortunately now we've got the same word for different things there. Sorry, that's just the way English is. But in this particular case, it's referring to the punctuation mark. Right, what is next? Okay, now we've got specifically referring to frames two up to four. Let's go back to our um, cartoon, or sorry, comic strip, and refer to frames two to four. And what is it asking? It's asking us to identify the figure of speech used in these frames. Okay, so let's go back and see what figures of speech we can identify. There we are. Here's frame two. You've got a nice loud crunch. Here's frame three. We've got munch crunch. And here's frame four, we've got Okay, now, what figures of speech are there? <coughs> well, actually, there aren't any. <laughs> and the reason I say that, um, we have there only sound devices. Now, um, don't worry about that too much. Um, in many exams, I have seen figures of speech confused with sound devices, just realize that this may happen and that somebody may ask you for a sound device when in, and sorry, for a figure of speech when in actual fact they want a sound device. The difference between the two, just for the record, sound devices have no effect on meaning. They only make the, um, the sound more relevant in the ears. Sometimes they improve it, sometimes they degrade it, but either way. Um, whereas figures of speech, you are actually rewriting um, literal language in such a way that it becomes figurative language and is therefore improved. But there are no figures of speech here. In fact, there are no words except single words. So now let's go back and see what our memo answer says. So just remember that we're not looking for figures of speech, we are in fact looking for sound devices. And there we are, we've got two. 
We've got either onomatopoeia, which is, you know, recreating natural sounds um, in words. And we've got assonance. Assonance is the repetition of vowel sounds. We also have, to my mind, hum. Assonance. Yeah, yeah, there is another one there. We've got the repetition of um, uh, consonantal sounds as well. But anyway, take a, be that as it may. All right. Oh, we've got rhyme. Yeah. Crunch rhymes with munch. <laughs> that is also a sound device, by the way. Rhyme, rhyme is a sound device. Anyway, very interesting. But there we have three potential answers for you. Okay, let's move on. And no, this is not a mistake. I thought you may want to just remind yourselves of the cartoon which we are currently studying before we go on to the next questions. There we go. Now, is the following statement true or false? Support your answer with one visual and one verbal clue. In other words, one clue referring to um, the picture and one clue referring to words. So, oh, just a, um, one other thing I wanted to mention here. It's very unusual to still find true or false questions being given. Lately, um, in most of the national exams, I see that um, they will ask you, provide evidence from the text to prove that the following statement is false or something like that. But they don't ask you to say if it's true or false. They just, they will give you the true or false factor and say, why is that the case? But anyway, in this case, uh, we've got a good old fashioned true or false question. And it's talking about Dennis's table manners. Let us just look at his table manners again. Okay, there is crunch crunch. Here we've got munch crunch. So it's obviously very noisy there. And here we got, okay, there he's talking with his mouth full, right, and dropping crumbs all over the place. How would you describe his table manners? And uh, it says Dennis has excellent table manners. I think in this case, uh, we can all agree that that's false. Do you agree? If not, too bad, so sad because I think that's the correct one. And then you've got your verbal clues, okay, the, the, the sound effects, crunch, munch, slurp, and the visual clue, okay, biscuit crumbs, spilling milk, too much food in his mouth, <laughs> etc., etc. Okay, and I like this, by the way, this is a, a true visual literacy question. You are asked to identify uh, factors out of the cartoon to back up your answer. Now, next question. What does this mean? Uh, Dennis says, you've really outdone yourself, Mrs. Wilson. Okay. Now, is he using that literally or figuratively? You have to ask yourself that. Um, you may get such a question. Now, Dennis is a very young kid. I think he's something like six years old. I don't know the actual details of that cartoon. But he's a youngster. So, if an adult were to say to me that um, I have really outdone myself, I would automatically think that question, is that literal or figurative? Because if it's said literally, it's a compliment. If it's said figuratively, you know, with irony or sarcasm, then it's an insult. But no, I don't think Dennis is insulting Mrs. Wilson. I say, I say that he's giving her a very high compliment. So, let's take a look at what our memo answer is. Okay, and there we've got she excelled or did even better than she usually does. All right. So, yes, you know, out of the mouths of babes as thou ordained praise. Um, uh, <laughs> youngsters are usually incapable of subterfuge or guile or any one of those things. They say what they mean, and very often 
um, they expect adults to say what they mean, which can cause confusion. <laughs> Here we are. And there we'll move on, refer to frame 7 and 8. Okay, let's go back to frames 7 and 8. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Here we are. 7, you've got Dennis saying, so... All right, seven and eight. There we are, you've got so with ellipsis. And the final question, what's what is it? Right, explain the effect of the use of ellipsis in frame seven. <laughs> well, again, this is something that you have to know. It is a question on punctuation. What is the function of ellipsis? It shows that a sentence has been deliberately left incomplete, or it can also show that something um, has been left out if the ellipsis comes in the middle of a sentence. But this one is the ending of a, a sentence, well, sort of ending, because it's taking place uh, between frames. So what is the effect of that? It's to show us, I think, that another statement is following. Let's take a look at the memo answer. You know, creates a pause, intensifies the suspense before the punchline in frame eight. Okay, creates the impression that Dennis is considering his next action. Okay, there are the memo answers. Um, if you get anything like that, um, it's fine, you'll get the mark. And <laughs> which emotion is expressed by Mrs. Wilson's body language. Right now, let's take a look at that. There we are. We've got Mrs. Wilson there. And you notice her head is swiveling around suddenly as she's reaching out to grab the empty glass. And what is her expression on her face? Fairly neutral, I'd say. There's no expression of like, hey, wow. But um, she's certainly uh, just been startled by what Dennis has said. So what emotion can we look for there? And here it is, surprise or astonishment, but not shock. And I think that whoever compiled this was brilliant to include not shock, because there is no expression of shock on Mrs. Wilson's face. Okay, now we are going to take a quick break. And uh, when we come back, there'll be more of the same. This is just a reminder that we are looking at um, comic strips as they are used in exams. And when we come back, we shall continue to look at examples from previous exam papers. Thank you. See you shortly. Welcome back. We are looking today at cartoons and comic strips as they are found in exams. And this um, series is aimed at the first additional language candidates of grades, uh, grades 10 and 11. Here we have a classic cartoon, uh, sorry, a comic strip on the board. And we've got here Hager the Horrible, the Viking. And is what's not um, put onto the screen. The other person in this comic strip is, of course, his wife, Helga. And I don't know why, but for some reason, Hager always appeals to me. Uh, must be something to do with the horns on the helmet. I don't know. And what do we have in this cartoon? We've got three frames. We've got um, Helga coming to Hager and presenting him with a chunk of, it says there, cold leftover pizza for breakfast. Um, you've got an expression on her face, which is obviously not very pleased with um, Hager. We've got Hager not very happy about what, uh, the food with which he's being presented. We've got Hager here with a, uh, again, an expression of uh, shall we say worry or something like that on his face? And he says, I wish I knew what I did to deserve this. 
and please note the use of ellipsis there because the sentence is unfinished. So I could do it again. <laughs> I don't think he's disappointed at all. I think he likes cold leftover pizza. <laughs> so do I, by the way, although I must say I prefer it hot, but I still find leftover pizza very enjoyable the, the day after. Now, however, let's take a look at the questions as they were found in the exam. Take a look at that. And it says refer to frame one. Okay, you want one word to describe how Hager feels about getting leftover pizza for breakfast. And it says state one visual clue to support your answer. All right. So first you have to say um, his mood. And then you have to say, how do you know that? All right. So always remember you have to back up your answer by referring to the text. Let's take a look at our um, frame here. What is his mood there? I mean, if I were to sit like this on a table and uh, put my mouth down and I'm looking at you and... What would my mood be at that stage? Think about that. I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to get the answer. All right? And what other, what visual clues do we have? Well, basically that is like that. And the expression on his face is not exactly a happy one. You could only just see his mouth behind his moustache beard and the whole collection of facial hair. All right? Now... So we need a mood, and we need a justification for that. Now we go to our classic memo answer. Right, there's his mood, according to this. Uh, and just by the way, there will be other correct answers to that. So just because you haven't thought of one of those, you may get another one. I mean, it could be, for example, he's frustrated. Um, he could be mystified. I would accept both of those, all right? And, but your clue here, he's not smiling and his head is resting on his hand, right? So yes, those are good clues. I'll go with both of those as correct. Um, I'll go with all of these words that they've got, disappointed, sad, unhappy, dissatisfied. I'll go with that, but I would say that it is possible for other words to be correct in this context. And I hope you agree with me. Let's move on. Now, here's the next one. Now we are referring to the font. This is a font question. Why is pizza in bold? Well, let's take a look. There we are. There's what's, what it's being asked. Why is that in bold there? You're getting cold leftover pizza for breakfast. All right. Also, it's, it helps if you say it out loud like that. <laughs> that works really well. Okay. Now, why, therefore, is it printed in bold? Now, obviously, it stands out at you. And that's the, the purpose. But why? So let us take a look at the memo answer here. All right. And here's what you've got. Emphasizing, louder, or stressing. And that's a perfectly logical answer to that question. And I don't think um, any one of you would have come up with anything better than that. Good. Let's move on. Okay, once again, not a mistake. I've put it in just to remind ourselves of the cartoon as we go between the questions. Right. Oh, we saw the ellipsis. There we are. Here's the ellipsis here. It's in frame two, just over there. And, um, well, why does the cartoonist make use of the three dots, the ellipsis? Well, I think, as is the case in the previous one, which we checked, I think we are being led up to a sucker punch. Um, that we are being tricked into an unexpected um, conclusion for the sake of humor, right, to show Hager's sentence thought is not finished, or to show that he is thinking of what he could have done wrong. 
All right. I would have actually said that um, we're being um, set up for a surprise ending, which is not what we expect to come after the ellipsis. That would have done pretty well. But don't worry, I haven't tampered with the original uh, memo or marking guideline in any way. Okay, moving on. There we are. Actually, that's, this question covers what I've just said. Explain what the reader thinks Hager is implying with these words. So we're still with frame two, please note. Okay, just as a reminder, let's go to frame two. Normally, what does it mean when somebody says, I wish I knew what I did to deserve this? It means they're being punished. And Helga is, in fact, attempting to punish Hager. However, she blew it. <laughs> so, okay, it seems as if he feels he's being punished. Okay, it seems initially as if he thinks he's in trouble for some reason. All right. But as we know, the punishment didn't work. Let's move on slightly there. Okay, there's the cartoon again. No, it's not an error. On purpose. Got to keep my, uh, giving you reminders. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Now we come to our multiple choice question. And uh, what does it say here? The cartoonist uses something to create humor. Is it <laughs> sarcasm? You all know what sarcasm is, don't you? It's irony with a cutting edge. It's irony used to offend. Right, a pun is a play on words, which normally relies on um, um, homophones or something like that, where you've got similar sounding words with different meanings. Okay, you've got irony, where the opposite of what is stated um, is in fact intended to be understood. And you have hyperbole, which is a form of massive exaggeration. And please note the pronunciation. I have heard a lot of people making a mistake, and they refer to it as hyperbole. Uh, it's not. It's hyperbole. In the same way that we have a school in Bloemfontein here called Unici. You actually pronounce that uh, final E in the same way you pronounce it with hyperbole. Okay. Well, the answer is pretty much irrelevant. It is, in fact, C, or irony, but, well, he's using irony because the unexpected happens. That's dramatic irony. You must make sure that you don't merely know what these words mean. You must be able to make sure that you can identify them in a text. That's something that you must be able to do. If you don't have all that knowledge and stuff, you certainly won't be able to answer questions like that. Right? Let's move on. We've got here, explain your choice in 4.3.1. All right. So now, 4.3.1, the choice is, well, irony, if you were correct. You may have chosen something else, and you may have been able to justify it. But I assure you that irony is the correct one here. So just take a look. There is a perfectly good explanation of why it is irony. Okay. Let's move on from there. And there it says that in frame three, we, learned, we learn that the opposite is true right? He doesn't think it's a punishment. He thinks, oh boy, awesome. I love pizza. Hunch. Right. <laughs> I can see so much of myself in this guy. All right, so far, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> now, here is a very interesting one. What does this show about his eating habits? Okay, well, 
From my point of view, I would say he's got excellent eating habits because he's not letting the leftovers go to waste. <laughs> okay, and he's not too fussy about his food because even though pizza is nicer warm, he couldn't be bothered warming it up because he enjoys it anyway. So great eating habits. Now, and of course he's using his hands, so he's not making a, a, a messy utensils for his poor wife to clean and you know, the plates have got to go in the th into the sink and da 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 Great eating habits, just like mine. But let's see what the memo answer says. <laughs> okay, um, this one, you notice the term open-ended. That means there is no specifically correct answer. Right, you've got, uh, uh, they, you know, might not be health conscious. Well, quite honestly, most of the pizzas that we make in my house are extremely healthy. You know, they're loaded with olives and um, mozzarella and uh, uh, fresh basil from our own garden and oregano and anchovy. Those are healthy ingredients. And we make this thick pan base so that it's, it's you know, gloriously rough stone ground flour used for the bread and everything. Of course it's healthy. I am health conscious. <laughs> but anyway, that's just, um, you know, you can argue in either direction here. Uh, not concerned about following a healthy diet. Um, any, any answer which merely addresses the question and you're going to get it right. Right. Oh, there we are. A candidate can score one mark. You see that? answer that is not well substantiated. So even if your um, answer is not that wonderful, don't worry, you can still pick up a mark. Now at that stage, we have come to the end of this little HBO mini-series, and we were looking at um, cartoons and comic strips as used in exams, we looked in the first part at the theory and the definitions behind them. And in the second part, we were looking at, or the second and third part, this is in fact the third part in the series, we were looking at the actual exam questions themselves with the cartoons being used. Just a reminder that this was aimed primarily, but not exclusively, at the English first additional language candidates. And, well, They'll benefit the most, but anybody else who wants to is free to enjoy this and to share it with others. People, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you again in the near future. Goodbye for now.